Now, there is a vast difference in someone who creates content and someone who is an actual activist, in my opinion. Hello again, and welcome back to The Brie Bear Show. I want to thank you for coming back or being here for the first time. Please make sure if you like this video as you watch that you hit the like button and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss a thing that I release. So today we're actually going to talk about the multi-level marketing industry and what is truly wrong with this industry that makes it kind of a target. So there are some issues and there are many reasons that scrutiny happens that people ask questions there are a lot of reasons for this entire movement of people coming out of the woodwork it seems like to tell their story about their multi-level marketing experience and really scrutinize what is going on in these companies my personal opinion on it though this whole anti-mlm movement is that they may possibly be going after the wrong thing or the wrong people. They oftentimes have a visual representation of a top leader or a person within a, a network marketing company. They're not always top leaders and they are picking apart, if you will, for lack of a better term, their behavior. They are pointing out their manipulation tactics. They are showing you the fallacies. They are pointing out the things uh, from the bite model, right? So they're, they are exposing you to the tactics most of the time that leaders within MLMs use to bring in more business for the company. I don't want to just know that the the people in multi-level marketing are maybe being harmful. I don't just want to know that. I want to also know why. Why do they have to act in this particular way in order to be successful in their business? Why do they have to potentially manipulate people, lie to people, tell have truths in order to get ahead? Why is it set up this way? What is the theme here? that we are seeing amongst all top leaders and then picking that apart and moving up the ladder, if you will, and finding what's above them that is creating this kind of trickle down effect. If we look at the structure, and I will get into this, the structure of pay in multi-level marketing, it is very thematic, it is very common, it is very generalized. Most MLMs pay out very similarly. What is wrong with it? Why do people have an issue? Why do people get burnt out? Why do people turn pro MLM to anti MLM? Why could someone like me go from being a very, very top producer in a company to one day setting it all down, getting a phone call and just saying, I quit, I'm done. I never want to be a part of this again. What kinds of things lead to that? That is the most important question to me. And that is something that I don't think anti-MLM has focused on enough. I think where anti-MLM has gone wrong is, you know, you can obviously be prefaced by going through my last round of videos and really, really get a good understanding of where anti-MLM has kind of gone off the rails where they have really taken a, tur taken a turn for the worst. And you'll be able to further understand that, of course, there are always going to be bad apples. So that happens, and we know that. And I really did, did um, highlight that and made sure in those previous videos to reiterate over and over again, not speaking of all anti-LM activists or creators. And notice I didn't call the people I was speaking of in my videos, activists, because I think that that word is reserved for people actually doing activism. And I called them creators because that is what they do. They create content. And I think that where anti-MLM has really gone wrong is not knowing how to separate those two things, not knowing how to decipher in themselves whether they are this or are they this. 
Are they an activist or are they a content creator? Are they both? Because that's possible too. There are some insanely good content creators who are also doing their own form of activism and I commend that. But if harm is being done in this chase for vindication and righteousness, I dare say that's not activism. I dare say it's just perpetual harm. I had no idea I was part of the bite model. I had no idea I was had been inducted into some kind of borderline cult or I, I didn't know any of this stuff. I just knew it was making me money and it was feeding my kids and that made me happy. And the people that use the product seemed happy. So I was completely oblivious. I didn't know it was indoctrination or anything like that. And I have been part of a church um, that is infamous for indoctrination, tactics, manipulation, etc. Um, and I still didn't recognize it. All right. Until February of 2020, I, I started to notice some things and uh, I really started thinking heavily about some things that I was seeing from a particular leader and it made me uncomfortable. And so instead of walking away from the industry completely, I just walked away from that team. And luckily I was only targeted by two people and the top leader that I had watched berate people for leaving her team didn't do anything, didn't say anything to me. She was kind about it, like honestly, no big deal. There were a few people who tried to come for me um, after I had posted about my new comp plan. I'm sorry, this screenshot is so small, but it was a, quite a long message. If you just turn your phone to the side, the long way, you can zoom in. But other than that, it wasn't a huge thing. So the indoctrination part, I really didn't notice. What I noticed as an up and coming leader at that time I noticed that I wasn't being rewarded a whole lot for bringing in customers, but I was being rewarded more, it seemed, for hitting ranks and bringing in other up-and-coming leaders that would do the same thing that I was doing. And then I went on to another company and they paid a really good, uh, they had a really good retail model where they paid you 50% of the dollar value. And so I felt like, okay, I'm being rewarded finally for being good at getting customers and being a good salesperson. Awesome. So I was doing great in that company and that fell apart, not just like for me, for almost all people. I don't even know if there's anyone left in that company now. So I moved on to another one. And then in this one, I found even more over and over and over again, there was this recurring theme of you get more praise, you get more reward, you are recognized more, you are represented as more of a talented person. If you recruit more, then you get customers. Customers were praised, if you will, a little bit in this company and you were rewarded well for them. It was 50% there again, but it was not on the dollar value it was on a volume value and i'll get into that and i found wow this is great i'm getting rewarded for being good at getting customers and then this um incentive trip came around i had already basically quit the company at that point but i did take my free trip everything was free except extras i even had my plane ticket covered but that was not the case for all. It was like a special thing if you got a certain level of points. So it wasn't like they give us a stipend or a per diem or anything to spend while we were out there, but it was, it, you know, for all intents and purposes, it was a free trip. If you had brought someone in with a pack, these packs ranged from $330 to, oh my goodness, um, over $1,000, I, I think, $1,500. And, you know, you got rewarded the most when a new person so a new business partner or a new recruit came in with a big pack. You got big rewards when that happened. So you'd get something like 25, 30 points. Again, I can't remember exactly, but it was a bigger number every time you recruited someone with a pack. If you recruited someone and they just paid the fee to start as an associate, you were not rewarded at all. So it wasn't that they wanted recruits that just didn't buy anything. They wanted recruits that bought big packs. Okay, so huge, vast difference there between getting customers, consumers, direct consumers who are taking their product 
big difference between that and bringing in new recruits, essentially glorified customers who are also taking their product, but bought $1,300 of it at a time. That's when I started to open my eyes. When we started running for that Cancun um, Cabo trip, I said, the way these points are, it is skewed. This is so skewed. This is highly in favor of recruiting and barely in favor of getting consumers for their product. And the biggest thing that the FTC comes down hard for is pyramid scheme-ish behavior. If you have way more recruits than you have customers, it starts to look like a pyramid scheme. Your revenue should be a certain percent, should be coming from solely consumers, customers, whatever you want to call them, okay? But I dare say that a lot of these companies are not doing that. Like legally, if you picked apart every customer account, most of them are not, are recruits uh, or associates, distributors, making customer accounts and ordering under those so that they would get paid on it. That's just a little trick of the trade that often happens in companies. But the general consensus, the general common theme amongst all network marketing companies that I've ever been a part of, and I've been a part of a handful, you barely got paid on customers, but you got heavily rewarded, recognized for bringing in business partners for creating a team. And here's what they tell you. It is a residual income opportunity. You will have income forever. When my team got even an inkling that I was quitting, they all just stopped working completely. And that residual income became zero income quite fast. Within a couple months, they all went off to different companies and I don't blame them. And you know, everyone kind of went and did their own thing and there was no residual anything past like three months. You continuously are pouring in time and energy over and over and over again into people, reminding them that their order is coming up, reminding them to set up their auto ship, reminding them to order period, reminding them, hey, you need your PV if you want to get paid. And if your company has all these crazy rules around getting paid and being active, you're sending out a lot of messages if you have a big team, basically begging people to make sure they place their personal volume order so that you can also get paid. It's absolutely absurd. So I always saw it as it is easier for me to maintain 400, 500 customers than it is for me to maintain 400, 500 team members. I wanted nothing to do with the team building. But I will tell you what happened. As soon as people find out you're good at sales in any way, shape, or form, it's, it's almost like they try to exploit that power that you have because not all people are good at sales. Very few people are good at sales. When they see that, you will stand out. When you stand out, you are going to get attention of master distributors, uplines, top leaders, corporate CEOs, and they are going to tell you things like, you know, if you recruited as many people as you have customers, you would be making X, Y, Z dollars. You would be at the diamond rank or you would be at the double, triple, quadruple, black, purple, yellow diamond rank. And you'd be making millions of dollars right now. They make it sound so easy and they don't tell you it's unsustainable and you're constantly chasing and replacing. And it's literally a mental health battle every single day of your life because you're dealing with so many different personalities. It's an absolute disaster, but they see you being a good salesperson and they, it's, it's like there is a target on your back. And that was the treatment I got. I was great at bringing customers. I was decent at building a team. But what I started to see was it was the most unreliable, unsustainable business model. I could rely on my customers because I was very close to my customers. My customers were my friends. I sent them Christmas gifts products from the company, 50, 60, $70 products just for free. I just, I loved my customers and I gave them the royal treatment. And I almost felt like, isn't it good enough to just be good at one thing and want to just do one thing? Why can't that just be good enough? And it wasn't. If we look at comp plans in general and the way that they pay out, they pay out for two actions. For one, 
bringing in a customer and for two, bringing in a business partner. So customer, they, you know, buy something like multivitamins and they might pay $39 for a bottle of multivitamins. And then if you bring in a partner or a recruit, then this bottle would be 30 or probably would be $29. And then you're now obligated as a business partner to order these multivitamins every single month. That is the obligation to remain active and get your PV, personal volume. Picture it like the volume is just a point number given to every bottle, every product, every SKU has its own PV amount. There's also a CV amount. It's a lot. There's commissionable volume. It's all different in all companies, but essentially there will be a volume amount attached to this bottle. And I get paid differently when I bring in a customer on this bottle of, of vitamins than it is when I bring in a recruit. But those are the only two ways that a transaction is generated. Most comp plans look like this. And here's where that structural issue starts to come in. Customer commission is usually way of pay number one in any comp plan. So if this bottle of vitamins is $39, it probably has a commissionable volume amount of something like 20, maybe 25. And most companies pay about 10% to 30% of the CV, commissionable volume of this bottle or whatever the product is. So if it was 10%, I would earn 250 on this bottle. If it was 30%, I would earn 750 on this bottle. But the bottle was how much? $39, I think. So you see there's a big gap in the amount that they pay the person who sold the bottle to the consumer and the actual revenue. Customer commission retail sometimes it's retail minus wholesale and that's what you get paid it's it, it is different in every company but the company absolutely 100 has to pay you for your customer um, acquisition as far as bonuses go if you are ever paid out on a bonus for customers it almost never is for anything but brand new customers. So some companies do have bonus structures where if you get 10 new customers in a month, uh, you get a $500 bonus or something like that. Or there was one company where they had a 10 and three, they called it, which meant 10 customers, but you also had to get three new recruits with a pack and they'd pay you $1,000 a month. So you see there is no reward, no recognition, no love given when you acquire a customer and you keep that customer for the company. I have never in my life, and I've been a part of a handful of companies, I have never seen a customer retention bonus. Okay, I'm here to eat my words. I have found a bonus called a VIP bonus and it does reward you for active smart ship. So that means they're ordering every single month customers. This was not in this company when I was a part of the company up to 2020. It's insane to me that these companies, it seems going by their comp plans, don't like customers. It's like, if you look at a comp plan and you pick it apart, they're trying to get you to do everything but get customers. So the second way of pay is usually a recruiting bonus. And this is what I was talking about before. If you bring in a partner on this bottle that is $39, 20 CV, they might pay you 10%, sometimes more, but it's usually a small percentage on these recruiting bonuses of their first purchase. So it could be anywhere from 10 to 30, 40%. So again, you might make $8 if they buy this. But sometimes they'll have these big packs and it will be like a $500 pack of products. The dollar amount is a $500 pack, but the volume amount is $300 and you're getting paid 10% of that. Then you would earn $30 every time you recruited someone with the $500 pack. 
yeah, 30 bucks, that's crazy. But some companies will pay you up to 100, maybe 200. Some companies do pay out decently when they give you a recruiting bonus or they're paying you to bring in people who purchase something when they come in as a business partner. They sometimes will pay fast starts, which is essentially, it, it, fast starts look different for all companies. Some companies call their fast starts like these bonuses that you can get in your first 90 days. Some companies have fast starts where if you hit a certain rank at a certain period of time, you get a certain bonus. But some companies fast starts are like a recruiting bonus, but they only pay on the first 30 days of that business partner's purchases. You never know what a fast start is going to be, but oftentimes there is some form of upfront incentive to get into a company and hit the ground running and just collect all those upfront bonuses. Sometimes they will stack on top of each other. I remember being in one company and bringing home, oh my gosh, like three, four bonuses because if you hit rank one, two, three, and four and they stack, you would get all of those bonuses. So some of these fast start models are very lucrative and very attractive for a new business partner or a potential business partner looking at your company because they're saying, oh, if I go in and hit XYZ rank, I'm guaranteed $10,000 or whatever it might be. This is also why you see a lot of company hoppers because they want to jump from company to company and collect those upfront bonuses. And when those bonuses run out, their income drops and they're on to the next one with a good fast start bonus plan. The Fourth way of pay typically is something like team bonus or team pay. It's usually 1 to 20%, depending on if it's a uni level or a binary, of your team volume overall. So it goes by levels if you're in a uni level, which means you're here, and then uh, below you are the people that you recruit as business partners as well to come in and do the same thing that you do. So it would look like one person here, one here, one here, one here, one here, and it just goes out. So width, not depth. This is typically because in a uni level, your front line or your first level, your immediate recruits are going to pay out the most because you usually get paid like 10% on level one or frontline. So what happens is, and this is that structure thing, leaders will keep everyone on their frontline so that they get 10% because what, what benefit is it of them to put someone here and then put someone here when as soon as someone goes to level two, you get paid 5% less on them or whatever, but it is less. Level two is almost always gonna be less payout and you're often not placing anyone either. You're keeping people right side by side and they build their own teams and that's where the depth might come from. But they're responsible for their own teams and you get paid a certain percentage on each level. That's a uni level. Now in a binary, it looks totally different. You are here and there's a binary, there's two. One team here, one team here. Okay, so you, team one, team two. One of these teams, is gonna be heavy and one is gonna be weak. So one's gonna have more volume and one's gonna have less volume. The one with the less volume of course is the one you get paid on. So they call it your pay leg, your weak leg. And they call the other one your heavy leg or your power leg. And you get paid anywhere from f usually five to 20% on one leg, your weak leg, your pay leg. So you could have a power leg of a million in volume that has just continued to accumulate, but you could have 500 in volume on the other leg and you're only getting paid on that 500 in volume every week or every month. That is team pay. There is volume associated with each bottle of pills or whatever nail stickies and makeup and whatever it is that you're selling, there is a volume amount attached to each SKU. If you sell 100 of these and they are 20 volume, that is 2,000 <laughs> in volume that you would get in your team. Not just you, but if you and your team 
sell a certain amount of, of things, that's the volume throughout your team. Sometimes the things you sell don't even go in the volume of your team, but that's, that's a whole nother story. The next way is usually a rank bonus. When you go and you hit these ranks, excuse me, you might get 500, 100, 250, um, all kinds of different numbers. They can range from 50 bucks to 5,000, sometimes more dollars, depending on how high of a rank you get up to. Usually these are gonna be time sensitive. And also you are usually going to have to maintain this rank for at least 60 days, usually more, sometimes 90 days. And if you don't maintain the rank, you're basically starting over at zero, working toward that bonus again. Meaning if you hit a rank of silver month one, you need to hit it month two and month three. And after month three of being silver, then they'll pay you. And then leadership bonuses is the sixth way. So sometimes there will be like leadership pools. If you hit a certain rank, like extra double important diamond, um, you might get 1% of the company volume in that given month. So if the company volume is a million, you might get 1% of that. And then some companies also have car bonuses. These are terrible, bad. I have a car in my driveway that I don't drive, but my husband drives and uh, we love it. It's a great car, uh, but we got it because it was a company paying for the car initially. But it was great when the company was paying $500. But then when I walked away, I was like, oh, I need to pay this myself now. Awesome. Some companies try to keep you longer by giving you a car bonus um, because it, it tends to tie people to the company for longer. Well, I need to stay so that they'll pay for my car payment. And that kept me in the company much longer than I intended because I let them pay my car payment as long as they would. Sometimes there are some other creative methods of paying. Um, like I said, there's like that 10 and three, there's like MVP bonuses. But those are typically, that's your real core, if you will. Most of those, so number two, three, four, five, six, and seven are all based on recruiting, not customer getting. And to me, that goes to show you that the structure is the problem. If you know that you are going to get paid heavily on recruiting, what are you going to focus on? If I get one customer, I get paid one way. If I get one recruit, that is gonna go toward four or five ways of pay. So why do you think manipulation happens? Why do you think people tend to want to build a team and then just sit back and collect? So why are we tearing apart these people who have done nothing but be exploited by the corporations who initiated and continue with this structure when we should be looking at the actual compensation plans in general and starting to ask these companies, why are these structured this way? That, my friends, is where I think anti-MLMers have gone wrong and that is where I think they could go right is if they started to look at what forms of legislation could be passed so that people get more pay for their customers, so that there's a minimum that you have to pay out for customers in any compensation plan. What kind of legislation would make it so that companies avoided paying five, six, seven ways on team volume and paid more ways on customers? What if they paid out on retaining customers? What if there were bonuses for retaining customers? There are so many questions that I could ask around that. It is the structure. If you like this explanation, if you like this video, please give it a like. Make sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification, and join me back here for the next video. Thank you for coming to the Brie Bear Show. Goodbye.